Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. If you are new here and you start to begin loving what you are hearing, please don't be shy. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. While you're at that, make sure that notification bell is set to on so you know every time I upload a video. If you are interested in becoming a member of the channel, that information can be found down below in the description box. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I don't usually share my stories, but I'm freaking out and I need advice. Something really strange has been happening the last few nights. I've been too scared to tell anyone, but I feel like I have to now. It started two nights ago. Mom was laying in bed trying to sleep when I heard this soft tapping noise. At first, I thought it was just the wind or maybe a tree branch, but then it came again. Tap, tap, tap. It was coming from my window. I live in a one-story house, so it's not that high up. But it's weird because there's nothing outside my window except our backyard and a tall fence. I tried to ignore it, but the tapping didn't stop. I finally worked up the courage to get out of my bed and peek through the blinds. That's when I saw him. There was a man standing outside, just staring at my window. He was tall with a pale face that looked almost, I don't know, empty? Like there was nothing behind his eyes. He didn't move. He just kept staring at me. My panic and ducked down. My heart was racing and I didn't know what to do. After what felt like forever, I finally crawled back into bed and pulled the covers over my head. I didn't sleep at all that night. The next day, I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, or maybe a dream. But last night, it happened again. The same soft tapping, the man outside my window. This time, I didn't even look. I just froze, hoping he would go away. I told my parents about it this morning, but of course they didn't believe me. They think I'm just having nightmares or something of the sort, and they told me to stop watching scary movies before bed. But I know what I saw. Tonight, I'm scared to go to sleep. What if he comes back? What if he tries to get in? I've checked the window multiple times to make sure it's locked, but I still feel like it's not enough. I don't know what to do. Has anyone else experienced something like this? Should I call the police? I'm freaking scared right now, and I just need someone to believe me. Please. A few weeks ago, I was driving in the middle of nowhere, heading to one of my friends. My wife was sleeping next to me while my teenage daughters were watching a movie in the back. Next to them, my toddler was playing with his toys. It was around 1 a.m., and I was nervous as the drive seemed to last forever. The dirt road with no lights gave me chills, as all I could see around me were only fields. The road had many holes, and I was trying to avoid them as much as I could. I was very focused on that when I saw in front of the car a luggage. It was in the middle of the road on my side. On the other side, a car was parked facing us. The car was completely in the dark as there were no lights inside of it or outside. I did not want to drive over the luggage, so my first instinct was to go out and move it. I was lucky to have my wife with me. She grabbed my hand and indicated me something on the right. 
One person was in the field looking sometimes at his phone, reason for which my wife saw him in the first place. I turned my car around and I was ready to leave this road when all of a sudden two people jumped in front of us from the field. There was no space on the road so I couldn't go without harming them. Two people were in front of my car, one luggage, a car, and the two people checking their phone in the field were behind us. I did not know what to do, so I did the only thing I could think of. I just turned around again, facing the luggage, and just drove over it. Fortunately, there was nothing inside it to damage my car. So, we got out of that situation completely unharmed. We arrived at my friend's house, and everything was perfect, and we had a great time there. However, I still get chills when I'm thinking about that incident. So, people from the field, let's not ever meet again. I live with my parents on their farm. We have a relatively big house with a nice back patio. We got a hot tub a while back, which my parents used a lot, and I sometimes join them. Since I have my own car, my parents have gotten more comfortable with leaving me at the house when they leave for extended periods of time. The longest they've been gone is almost a week, and they kept in contact with me the entire time. I just take care of our animals and chill out when I'm not working, and I've gotten used to being alone. My parents were both raised in farming and ranching families, but I was a city kid until they bought a farm and moved us out here. I'm used to it now, but it took quite a bit of acclimating, considering I've lived in our previous house for 13 years and knew the city like the back of my hand. You could have placed me anywhere, and I'd be able to find my way back home one way or another. It's been a few years, and I consider myself well-adjusted. Obviously, there's pros and cons, but I'm at peace with where we are now. One thing that took a lot of getting used to was how much space we have. In my old house, my bedroom window lined up with my next-door neighbor's kitchen window, so my curtains were drawn about... 95% shut of the time. Now, with my bedroom being on the second floor and our neighbors being a hundred or so yards away, I can get changed with the window open and not worry about being seen. I mention this because it's unusual to have someone walk past our driveway nowadays, as opposed to the city, where it was weird when people didn't pass by. Anyway. This took place a few weeks ago, and my parents had gone to a distant cousin's wedding, leaving me at the house to look over the farm. I was fine with this, as I didn't really know said cousin very well. But I sent my well wishes with my parents, and we sent constant updates back and forth for the few days that they were gone. Earlier, I mentioned that we had a hot tub on our back patio. I believe it was a second or third night, and I'd gotten home from work absolutely exhausted and decided to relax in the hot tub for a bit to soothe my sore muscles before going to bed. I'm a bit of a night owl, so by the time I'd taken a nap and had dinner, it was around 11 p.m., and the sun had pretty much set. Another one of my favorite things about living on our farm is the lack of light pollution. I can look up and easily see the stars above me. I've always been into astrology and astronomy, and I love stargazing. That was part of the reason I waited so long before going out to the hot tub. Anyway, I went out and got myself settled and just sat in the hot water, enjoying the stars and heat and occasionally sipping my drink I'd brought out with me. It was still light enough that I could still see the edge of our property, but dark enough that I could see the stars relatively well. I had probably only been out there for about 10 minutes when I suddenly got a chill down my spine, and it wasn't from the breeze on my heated skin. I felt like I was being watched. 
Immediately, I snapped out of my daze and turned to where I felt the feeling and where it was coming from. It took my eyes a bit to adjust. I'm nearsighted, but didn't wear my glasses outside. And when they did, I felt my stomach drop at what I saw. From the patio, looking straight ahead, you can see our barn, which has some fences connecting to it that made up a couple of pens. Our older horses are in the largest pen to the right of the barn, and behind that pen is the large field that stretches to a row of saplings. Behind those saplings is a barbed wire fence, which indicates the edge of our property. To the left of that barn is a patch of trees that lead into the forest that surrounds our property, though there are a few divots here and there where we've set up some old farm things, like a garden and a chicken coop. While I couldn't see directly behind the barn, I could see beyond it, into the field behind the pens, which is where I spotted what I figured caused my feeling of unease. A few feet out of the forest, standing between two of the saplings at the edge of our field, was a figure of what I assume was a person just standing there in the darkness. I immediately knew that that was where that feeling was coming from and I stood up in the hot tub and turned to face the person. For a few moments, I just stood there, looking at them. I don't know if they saw me, but when they didn't move after me, staring at them for a solid minute, I decided enough was enough and I got out of the hot tub. I closed everything up as quickly as I could while trying not to look panicked and went inside, where I immediately turned on all the lights shut all the windows, and locked all doors. My dog has been inside the entire time, none the wiser to the trespasser, and I figured it'd be best if I didn't alert them to what was going on, just in case it turned out to be nothing, even though I was pretty sure I was right about what I had seen. I debated on calling the police, but I lived 20 minutes from the nearest town. So, by the time they got there, the person would likely be gone. Besides, it was midnight at this point, and I didn't want to wake any of my neighbors with the commotion authorities may bring. I resolved to sit in the living room with my dogs and keep an eye on the person from inside. Our living room has windows that face outside in the same direction our back door to the patio does. So... I could still see the same view from the hot tub, albeit a little more difficult with the lights on. But ever since I'd seen that figure, it was impossible to not notice them afterward. The thought crossed my mind to grab my stepdad's rifle from the basement, but I had no idea where he stored it or even how to use it. So it likely wasn't a wise idea, especially because Going to get it would mean I'd have to leave my post in the living room and leave the person unsupervised. The more time passed, the more antsy I became. The person was just standing there, not doing anything, in the same position I've spotted them in. And their apparent lack of motive was unnerving me like nothing else. I resolved that. If they didn't leave within the next hour and a half, I'd call the police. Because at that point, the person would have been standing there for about an hour, trespassing on our property. More time passed. I stayed in the living room, my phone in hand and dogs at my feet, looking out the window every few minutes to see if the figure was still there, which they were. By now, it was 12.15 in the morning and they were still standing there and hadn't moved. Internally, I was thinking about who this person could possibly be and what reason they'd have to do this. We're a friendly community, and we pretty much know all of our neighbors, though everyone mostly keeps to themselves. It was unlikely that anyone knew my parents were at home and that I was alone. There were two vehicles parked in our driveway, mine and my mom's, as my parents had taken my stepdad's truck to travel in. As far as I knew, we didn't have any issues with anyone, which made the scenario even more confusing and terrifying. 
It was 12.20 when things finally changed. As I looked out the window for probably the 50th time that night, I saw the figure move. I froze, not moving a muscle. As I watched them turn and walk back the way I assumed they came, to the left, where they disappeared behind the barn, presumably back into the forest. My relief was only temporary, because while they were gone, they could still very well be on our property, just hiding out there in the trees. The feeling of being watched was gone, though, which made me feel a little bit better, though not by much. I decided to pull an all-nighter and stay up until the sun rose, and I passed out on the couch. I woke up at around 1 p.m. and had a moment where I thought I'd dreamt the whole thing. Just in case, after I finished my chores, I made my way across the field behind the animal pens to our property line and walked from one end to the other to where the figure would have disappeared behind the barn to see if I could find anything out of the ordinary. It had been dry for the past week, so the grass and dirt didn't show any footprints or any sign anyone had been standing there at all, which made me suspect that maybe I had originally imagined the whole thing. I have a history of being paranoid because of my anxiety and have been multiple nervous breakdowns over things that turned out to be inconsequential still. I couldn't just forget about that feeling I'd gotten in the tub that night. The unmistakable feeling of having someone's eyes on me and not being able to tell who. To this day, I have no idea who it could have been. And to be honest, I don't really want to. Nothing like that has happened since, and I'm hoping it stays that way. To the figure that stood at the edge of my parents' property and watched me in the hot tub, in the middle of the night. I hope we never meet again. This just so happened to pop up in my head. It was an incident from two years ago today, and I thought it would be worth sharing with you. It's definitely one of the scariest encounters I had and definitely taught me to really trust my gut. September 4th, 2022, I was at home waiting on my boyfriend to get home. It was getting late and I was impatient, so I decided to go out to get snacks from the gas station by myself. We live in a city that really isn't the best place for a then 22-year-old woman to be out alone at night. It's normal to hear gunshots, see cars get stolen, and there have been armed robberies at both of the gas stations by the house since I lived there. Nevertheless, I was hungry and wanted some snacks, so off into the night I went for them. On the way to the gas station, my boyfriend passed me headed home on his bike when I was nearly there, a detail that is crucial to how things would play out. It was some time around or shortly after 11 p.m. that I made it to the 7-Eleven and pulled in by a pump. Before I even had a chance to take the keys out of the ignition, a woman was standing at my passenger side door trying to talk to me through it. Another long story short, before this had happened, my best friend and I had a couple attempt to carjack us in another city. Ever since then, I have always locked my cars the second I get into my car and had done that just this night. I stayed in my car and told her I couldn't hear her, so she walked to my side of the car. She said something along the lines of her ride not being able to pick her up because her car broke down and that she needed a ride while holding up texts on her phone. I told her, I'm really sorry, I don't help people at night, and immediately drove away. I was annoyed that I didn't get my snacks, but wrote it off. Just before arriving at my house, I take a left turn, then start down a curving road with a shopping center in the right. The first light on this stretch of road leads to my neighborhood where I make another left in. 
When I took my first left and approached the entrance to the shopping center, a car swerved out in front of me and stayed on the center line the entire way to the light. I kept my distance and pulled in behind them into the turning lane of the neighborhood. When we made the turn, they stopped next to the curb on the right side of the entrance. This put me on a very high alert and I passed them quickly. I am going to try my best to describe the shape of the area of the neighborhood that this took place in for context. When you pull into the neighborhood, there is a long straight road that has a left-hand turn shortly after the entrance and a right-hand turn further down. Both experiences connected into a loop going around the entire neighborhood and the straight road we were on is this main road in and out that connects them. I passed them on the main road and drove down to the second turn to head to my house. When I passed, they started to drive as well and followed me at a distance. Other people pull in behind me at this time, but this just felt different. I passed my parking spot, but took note that my boyfriend was home, making my way through the loop that would lead them to another entrance. For a split second, I almost thought I was overreacting and I turned around, but as we've made our way down the road, I knew I wasn't. As I drove slowly toward the loop over the speed bumps to prevent speeding, they got closer and closer to me. Over the last few, they were so close I could see the front of their vehicles. After the last bump, there is a small turn with a dumpster and then a straight to the main road. When we hit this curb, a man was walking to the dumpster and they backed off significantly. I took this as my chance and took off away from them. I turned left back towards my house on the main road while yelling at Siri to call my boyfriend. Come outside with the XYZ and floored it down the main road, blaring my horn the entire time. The car gunned it after me, and I prayed that my boyfriend would be outside in time. I quickly pulled into my spot, still honking, and the car skidded to a stop behind my car at an angle, so I couldn't back out shortly after I parked. The two grown men immediately jumped out of the car while I stayed in mine, horrified. They quickly started to approach my doors until they saw that someone was waiting for them. My boyfriend told them that they needed to get back into their car and leave, and to not make a single move toward me. They decided to argue, saying that I followed them, and some other nonsense that I honestly couldn't understand over my sheer panic and adrenaline rush. My boyfriend was ready to stand his ground and do whatever he had to do to protect me, and conveyed that. The men eventually left, and I took my time getting out of the car, still in complete and utter shock. The police were called, and showed up nearly two hours later, saying that they didn't see the car in the area. I wonder why. They never looked any further into the investigation. Needless to say, my boyfriend was with me every night and would even meet me at the entrance of the neighborhood after work to ride me home for some time after. I often think about what those men would have done if I had turned around or even had thought twice and pulled in my space to begin with. Would they have followed me all the way to the police station if my boyfriend was at home? Was that woman a part of it? The whole thing makes me nauseous. I had a feeling for a couple of weeks before this happened to keep an extra eye out on cars behind me to make sure that I wasn't being followed. A crazy thing to look back on now. It's very scary to think about how things could have ended if I had let that woman in my car or didn't have someone to scare me off. To the woman who approached my car and possibly set me up, go kick rocks. To the men who followed me home and intended to do God knows what to me, let's definitely never, ever meet again.
Okay, so this happened a while ago, and it's pretty mild compared to some other stories I've read. But I think about it a lot. When it comes to getting my driver's license, I was a bit of a late bloomer living in the city. However, this wasn't as big of a deal as walking or public transport and rideshare apps were all extremely accessible, and I had no trouble getting where I needed to go. Most of the time, I used Uber to get to work and met a lot of local Uber drivers, some of which knew me by name. There were a lot of encounters of drivers, creeping, but never too bad, so there's only one that really sticks out and scares me to this day. I was maybe 23 at the time, working an office job downtown, and had ordered an Uber to take me home from work. I didn't recognize him, but everything was pretty normal at first. I hopped in, we said our hellos, he confirmed the address, and we started driving. The driver was a guy in maybe his mid to late thirties, heavier set, and very smiley. He was continuously glancing in the rearview mirror at me, more than average, and nearly immediately told me that he'd picked me up before, which was someone who Ubered almost daily did not strike me as all that odd. But then the things he said started to get really weird. He asked me why I didn't still work at my former job. I was surprised and a little bit alarmed that he'd remembered where I used to work, as I hadn't worked there since I was 19. So he had apparently remembered me from about three to four years ago. He also remembered my hometown where I went to high school college, what I studied, and how many siblings I had, and confirmed it all with me like, you are from Redacted, right? So you went to Redacted High School, and you have two younger sisters, correct? Still studying art history at Redacted University? All of this might not be too odd for an attentive and friendly driver except I was never a talkative passenger and usually avoided small talk and kept quiet in the Ubers. I have no memory of ever telling any Uber this specific kind of information, as when asked, I would give a vague answer such as, oh, I'm about 40 minutes south, or yeah, I got some siblings. I'm not close with them, though. Anything to avoid giving details to the strangers who knows my address. So it was extremely weird to me that he remembered such details, info especially about me. He then went on to ask a bunch of personal questions, such as my relationship status, what year I graduated high school, where I'd like to go hang out with friends. He also knew about my male roommate somehow and inappropriately asked me about my relationship to him. At this point, I was getting extremely uncomfortable, and my answers were becoming more and more curt, and he was not taking the hint. It got to the point where I stopped being cooperative with the questions at all, and just started giving vague one-word answers or pretending not to hear the questions until he gave up asking and moved on to the next. All in all, he remembered quite a bit of my personal information about me, much of which I had no memory of telling him, and unabashedly asked for more. Despite my obvious discomfort, he did not stop questioning me about my personal life for the entirety of the 10-minute drive, all while glancing back at me through the rearview mirror at every opportunity. Towards the end of the ride, he began complimenting me, telling me that my name was pretty and that I was very beautiful and smart, and saying that he hoped we were paired together again because I was his favorite rider. Upon approaching my apartment, he asked me which door was mine so that I wouldn't get wet. It wasn't raining. Obviously, I told him my landlord's door and he pulled up to my door anyway. Before he unlocked the door, he turned around to smile at me and said, this is the longest ride we've ever taken together. Before saying that, he hoped to see me soon 
and told me to have a good night. I just walked out to the side of the building and waited for him to leave before immediately reporting him. Thankfully, this was back when Uber had real humans for customer service and they responded that they would be blocking him for matching with me for future rides and would be investigating whether he would be allowed to use the app anymore. I took the bus for the next few weeks and never saw him again. I also never had any other Uber driver like that again. It still creeps me out how he knew all that information about me. But I am so glad I have moved on since that happened. So my story to tell is actually quite a chilling one and happened a long time ago and comes from a brief yet highly disturbing encounter. Despite it being brief, it would eventually leave a long lasting impression on me and will likely remain the most messed up thing I have ever experienced. My story began when I was a 14 year old boy. To give some context, I was one of those part of the group but not one of the group types. Shy and reserved, I had friends but not much beyond school hours. So when one of my friends wanted me to hang out with her, it made a welcome change to my quiet after school routine of video games. We walked back to hers from school and she invited me into her house. As I walked in, I saw whom I quickly assumed was her dad with his back to me preparing food. This was the first time I'd been introduced to him and my first impression would quickly be putting it very mildly, not great at all. As my friend introduced me, he turned around to face me, holding a large kitchen knife. Suddenly, he lurched towards me as if he stumbled forward yelling, whoa. He quickly turned the knife, pushing the handle quite hard into his chest. He then smirked with the eeriest expression on his face and said, <laughs> only joking. My heart was pounding and inwardly I was freaking out. And while I tried to nervously laugh it off, I am sure my face clearly said otherwise. My friend just laughed it off as, that's my dad, he always likes pulling around. It led me to her living room. But as I sat down, I couldn't shake the uneasy gut feeling I now had. I tried to shake it off and talk to my friend, but her dad promptly entered the living room. They had music playing moderately loud on a stereo and he cranked the volume to a level that sounded like a live band was in there with us. My friend followed him to the kitchen and soon returned. She told me she had to go to the store to get something for him and ask if I wanted to wait for her as it wasn't too far. Given the rather creepy encounter, my gut instinct was having none of it, and I wouldn't be ignoring it. I quickly got up and left with my friend for the store. I can't say exactly how the rest of the day went, as I can't remember, but I do know I did not want to return to that house again. I wouldn't speak of what happened after that for quite some time and just chalked it up to a really freaky interaction locking it away in my mind. However, it wouldn't end there. He would set foot in our house a year later, dropping my friend off at a family party we were having. I didn't interact with him then, though my dad offered him a beer and later recalled how he just stood in a corner alone, watching everyone. I would see my friend's dad for the third time a couple of years later this time on TV, as the face of the man convicted for the abduction and murder of a woman who went missing a week prior. I just stood there, right as the story broke of who he was. I will never, for as long as I live, forget the sensation of my blood turning ice cold within my veins. 
My parents later commented how they literally saw the color drain from my face in that moment. Yet, in the days that followed, it only got worse. He would go on to confess while in custody to the abduction and murder of a woman who had been missing for 20 years by that point. Following corroborations of things he had said previously, along with expert analysis, led the police to believe he may have actually been a prolific serial killer. He was soon probed as a potential suspect in almost half a dozen unsolved missing person cases. However, due to a lack of evidence and further confession, his involvement in those remained unclear. My mind still occasionally wonders to the first encounter. Even though his choice of victim seemed to be a woman, I can't help but think about that music cranked up that loud. How my friend asked me if I wanted to wait for her at the house with him. If I had stayed, what would have happened to me, if anything at all? Was there a part of him that was curious? Wondering about switching things up a little? Or was that knife held to my chest truly just the harmless joke of a serial killer? I don't know, but it still haunts me and my dreams to this day. This is so bizarre. This isn't even a memory I forgot. Just one that I basically turned into my own fun anecdote to make it less scary. 11 years later, it's freaking scary. And I know how lucky I really was. For context, I was a fresh 21 year old and had recently rediscovered a love of dance and started enjoying concerts and festivals. I had attended my first festival at age 20 and had the most amazing time volunteering and meeting people. It was a last minute and unexpected situation that first year, but after the amazing experience I had, I was hooked. It's prudent to add that I was extremely naive and obviously new to that kind of scene. So. The next year, I had cut off my friends I'd gone to the festivals with before, but still had friends of friends that went that I got along with really well and had good memories with. So even though I was going to my second year at the same festival, I was going solo and just camping with friends of friends, which I suppose was the beginning of the problem. I got going kind of late. So when I got to the festival, the lines to get in were extremely long. I'd packed diligently, but the service wasn't great, and I was having a hard time contacting the semi-friends that I was camping with. By the time I found them and had set up, it was dark. It was a newer but pretty large festival, and I have a really bad sense of direction. In future years, I'd learned to bring batteries, solar lights, and obnoxious decorations because of this night. It was also a different location that year. So, unfamiliar with where I camped, with my surroundings. Second part, I messed it up. My ex-roommate, Tom, and his girlfriend, Gina, were the ones I was closest to. And Tom was bringing some special acid for me. As a kind of an apology for not sticking up for me in a roommate situation. It's a more different sub, so I haven't posted about it. We all went to the first show together, but all got really high very quickly. I took too much, and I knew it was pretty quickly, so I knew the night was going to go sideways. But by the time I realized, Tom and Gina had wandered off leaving me completely alone. I tried to find my way to my tent, thinking I'd lay down for a bit and be okay. But I couldn't remember how to get to it or where it was. It was dark, and I was starting to panic, being that I was high as shit and didn't know where anyone I knew 
was. It was dark, and I was starting to panic, being that I was high as shit and didn't know where anyone I knew was. Didn't know how to find my campsite or anything. I was in a crop top and jean shorts and high desert at nighttime, so it was starting to get cold. I wandered over to the disco area because it was the first thing I found. Had a legit disco ball and all. I'm wandering around and see this woman in the most unusual clothing. Think about Pioneer. So I went to talk to her. I genuinely do this day don't know if the person was real. That's how messed up I was. We end up wandering around. Again, I don't know if this is a real person or a hallucination. Trying to find my campsite when we reach the RV or car camp area. This man, maybe early 30s, with glow sticks asked me if we want any and we say yeah. She goes first, then as soon as it's on her wrist, goes skipping away. I call out to her to wait, but she doesn't stop. The man looks at me and says, Are you okay? Do you think you can find your friend? I stupidly say, Oh, <laughs> I don't know her really. I can't find my campsite and she was helping, but oh well. He responds with, You remind me a lot of my little sister. I wouldn't want her running around lost like this. Look, my buddy and I are going to watch XYZ shows, and I wouldn't feel right leaving you, so you could stay in his RV for a few hours to sleep it off if you would like. Obviously, I was too high, too young, too naive to see where this would go, and I stupidly complied and followed him. It was fine at first, it was all a toy holler. I think that's what it was called. So the back end was like a U-Haul that stayed open. The first guy put in an album I would previously loved as a teenager, but now can still barely listen to, tucked me in and left. I didn't see his buddy at that point. Fast forward to God knows how many hours. I've been tripping out to this music and actually been getting to the point of okay when they got back. For the record, I didn't request this particular band. It was just on a loop. First thing was the guy that told me I looked like his sister climbing on top of me while I was half conscious, kissing my neck and touching me. Then I felt the second one in his hands. I was still so high and out of it, but immediately told them to stop, that I wasn't in a place for that. They got angry, and the one who gotten me there was the most frightening. I saw his eyes change in that moment and knew I was messed up if I couldn't get away. It didn't matter how high I was. I needed to get away from them. I don't even recall formulating a plan. I remember the main man saying, We helped you. Now you owe us. And slamming my knee into his groin, I may have forgotten that he was on top of me at that point. All I remember is running for my life into the very prickly bushes, not knowing where I was going, but desperately running away. The second man seemed a bit nervous about the whole thing and didn't do much except for touch me while the other one held me down with the weight of his body. I met a couple of kind souls that calmed me down when I was completely freaking out crying, covered in dirt and thorns, and they gave me a safer space. I didn't sleep that night, so I could no longer trust the kindness of strangers. But I also couldn't find my camp. It was ten yards away as I discovered the next day. The two men who tricked me trapped me and would have done something inevitable bad to me. Let's not meet again. And also, fuck you both. Oh, and I forgot to add this, because it's a pretty intense memory for me. But I'm pretty sure the only reason I got away is because they were on something. I hadn't even met guy number two before, so I don't know anything about him. But the one I did seemed crazy and very amped and high and just out of it. And yes, 
I know the whole thing was stupid of me. I was not even a month into 21, though, with very little life experiences. So, yeah, to the two guys, fuck you again. I work at an outdoor mall in a great neighborhood. You'd assume that it's safe as hell to be here, but then again, you can't just be sure anymore. There are creepy people everywhere, and I just can't help shake the feeling that this isn't my best encounter with this man. I'm a 19-year-old, and I worked at a kiosk that sells all kinds of wonky jewelry. It's usually teens, young adults, and occasionally some older adults that shop with us. Every once in a while, this man comes up to the kiosk, easily recognizable. Same leather jacket, crinkled corners of his eyes, one front tooth shorter than the other, same slouched walk, the usual. He's usually harmless, but oh my good God, the last few times he's come by, he has made me so uncomfortable. I greet every customer with, hey, can I help you find something? And most of them say they're just looking. He always smiles at me and says, just looking, darling. At first it was fine. I didn't care whatsoever. He seemed like a harmless 50 or so years old man. He always spent a very long time looking at the display and never bought anything. Most of the time, I'm working the night shift. At the kiosk, I'm surrounded by other shoppers and other kiosk workers. Mine is kind of all by itself in between two empty ones in the back. The mall sales have been going uphill and downhill the last few years. And I'm usually left alone, minus the friendly security woman that stops and chats with me on her rounds. She comes by every 30 minutes or so, and she's one of the few friends I do have at work. The only stores in my view were Reebok and Macy's. A few nights ago, I was sitting at my kiosk, bored out of my mind, and the security lady had already continued on her way. I had scrolled through Reddit already and was getting ready to open up Netflix and continue watching Terrace House. When I hear footsteps coming up, I look up to see the creepy old man staring at me, but not actually at the kiosk yet. I wave at him and he gives a little smile, but one that sends chills down my spine. A customer walks up and I immediately jump at the chance to help them, trying to shake that creepy feeling I had. After I had checked out the customer and written down the receipt, I glanced up at the man who was still staring at me. Before I could say anything, he started walking over, taking my eye contact as permission to come join me. Good evening, darling, he says, doing an almost bow. Good evening, I told him. He proceeded to do his usual checking the display, not buying anything. Instead of walking around the cart, he stayed by the register where I was, walked around my chair and checked the sides, but never went where he couldn't see me. Then he started asking questions like we were longtime friends. So darling, do you have a boyfriend? I kind of gut at first because I've been single for over a year now. I told him no, I didn't have a boyfriend, but there was a checkout girl I found pretty damn cute at my local grocery store. Hmm, I see, he said. Do you have any plans after work? He asked me. I was getting really uneasy at this point, and I told him yes, I was going to a party. You gonna hook up with any boys? He asked. My jaw dropped. Whether or not I was hooking up with any guys was in no way any of his damn business. But I just told him no. He smiled a little and said, Good. You're too pretty for them little boys anyway. 
he faced me again and came up to hug me. Until this point, I hadn't realized my heart rate increasing, and it only became apparent after I found it harder to breathe. Before he could actually do so, Linda, the security woman, walked up and glared at him. Sir, if you're not going to be buying anything from this young woman, I suggest you loiter somewhere else. He stiffened at the sound of Linda's voice. She's a very intimidating woman. And he left. Are you all right, honey? She asked me. I shrugged. He's always here, I told her. She shook her head. Let me and Russ walk you to your car after work, okay? I nodded, relieved that she offered without me asking her. The rest of my shift is fine. I get through it and manage to make my bosses a bit of money. At 10 o'clock, on the dot, Linda and her boyfriend, Russ, are at my kiosk. They wait for me to pack up my purse and then walk me to my little Prius. They wait for me to drive away as well. On my way to the party, I stop by a gas station to fill up the tank. As I'm waiting for it to fill, I glance over and see the man from the mall at the Mini Mart. He's buying a pack of cigarettes, and he looks out the window and sees me. When he does, he smiles and waves. He holds up one finger, asking me to wait a minute. I don't. I yanked out the fuel hose and jumped into my car, booking it out of there. I take several detours before arriving 30 minutes late to the party. I had to make sure I would lose him before showing up there. It's been a few nights since that happened, and the only reason I'm writing now is because I'm actually working the morning shift, and I saw him walk out of the Macy's across from me. Linda has someone biking around this half of the mall, so he won't come near me today. But keep me in your thoughts, guys. I need it. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes, along with our gifted memberships. Donna, Nat Davies, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Haunted, and Anita V. As I always say, thank each and every one of you for being the pillars of which Back to Ashes stands. There's a special place in my heart for all of you. Thank you so much. And now for our gift of memberships, the Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grid, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your continuous support. I really do appreciate it. And to all the subscribers or new listeners, Thank you for supporting the channel. Always remember, please, without you, I don't have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.